we'll see if it's working. Okay. So we will start in approximately one minute. We are live right now, but we'll wait for people to uh, jump on and uh, we'll start right at two. Do you have any, do you have an uh, idea about how many you'll have today? Uh, I'm thinking about anywhere from like 60 to 100 okay. based on the shares. Uh, and uh, just the engagement from the flyer we posted. Okay, sounds good. I think we had around 80, 80 shares, which is pretty good. Amy, you're on mute. I said, you're, you're very popular, Terry. Lots oh. of shares. <laughs> no. All right, so it's uh, two o'clock. Welcome, everybody. I am uh, Virgil Moorhead, and I'm going to be the facilitator today. I have a couple of my colleagues, as well as Terry Cross here. Uh, it is about two o'clock on the button, uh, a little bit foggy here in McKinleyville. Uh, for those of you that are tuning in for the first time, this is Two Feathers Native American Family Services Speaker Series. We're in Northern California, Humboldt County, about five hours north of San Francisco. And uh, we have been doing these speaker series, uh, this speaker series for about two months, a uh, month and a half now. And so I'm going to turn it over to introduce my two colleagues before I introduce Terry. So Amy, could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Amy Matheson. I am a family support coordinator here at Two Feathers, uh, which means I do intensive uh, wraparound services with our families. And prior to that, I worked um, at Humboldt County Child Welfare Services in the emergency response unit, uh, where I worked uh, closely with our local tribes and families um, around ICWA. And I'm really excited to be here and to be speaking with Terry. Thank you, Amy. And uh, Chris Shaw. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Chris Shaw. You may know me from our uh, youth engagement series, but I am also the prevention coordinator here at Two Feathers, and I am also a going into MSW student, so I'm excited to learn from Terry and to hear what he has to say. Thank you, Chris. And so Terry Cross is Seneca. He's the founding founder of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. He received his master's degree in social work from Portland State in Portland, Oregon. He is the founding executive director of the National Institute of uh, National Indian Child Welfare Association and now serving as the senior advisory. He is the author of Positive Indian Parenting and co-authored Towards a Culturally Competent System of Care as well as many other uh, articles. He has over, I think it may be 47 years, coming on 50 uh, of experience in child welfare, including direct services over 10 or close to 10 uh, years of direct practice. He has really been an advocate and one of the leaders in the last you know, 40, 50 years for 
put, put, putting the, the rights and the welfare of Indian children first. And so I'm honored to have Terry Cross on here today. Welcome, Terry. Thank you, Virgil. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm, um, I'm gonna start out today um, with a few slides, kind of set some uh, tone and then just uh, turn it over to Amy and Chris to ask questions and, and we'll have a little bit of dialogue here as we, we go along. Um, one of the things that I'm um, most concerned about is the um, application of, of our own capacity to heal ourselves and our communities from a long history of, of ills. And I'm going to talk about um, both how that came to be and what we can do about it and, and the what I think of as a an essential component of um, having uh, child welfare services that are good medicine. Um, you know, in our in our culture, we talk a lot about having medicines uh, that, whether it be plants or ceremonies or things, and it's so important that our services for families and uh, for children be good medicine to bring about healing rather than to bring about, you know, to perpetuate more trauma. So let me uh, share my screen and I'm going to um, share um, a, oh, by golly. I have to be able to hit all of the buttons, I guess. I'll get there. There, can you guys see the PowerPoint? Uh, no. Not yet. Not yet. All right. Well, maybe I'll have to do this um, just but with powerful points. Is it a little green, the share screen, or you could... Uh... Yeah, I did my, um, by golly, oh, let's, let me see. It is, um, for some reason, it is not um, allowing me to do, no, oh, it's, it says it doesn't want to do that. Okay. So let me, um, let me just make, uh, some, I'll, I'll tell you what I was gonna show you. Yeah, you could also email it to me if you want. I can oh, you can, it. okay. Um, uh, uh, and... Yeah, well, let me just, uh, I'll, let me talk and uh, okay. you can uh, shut me up when it's time. All right. <laughs> um, this uh, part of what I have to say is, is based in the, the need uh, for us to go through a process that I refer to as decolonization. And a lot of authors have written about this, and uh, but uh, it's based on a notion that for any um, any colonial power to to um, take over and control the indigenous population, they have to do five things well. They have to take the land first of all. Um, they have to usurp the governance uh, of the people who are of that land. They have to take the natural resources, particularly food and water, because if you can control food and water, you can control people. And the, if you can take natural resources, you can control the economy. They have to um, delegitimize thought. In other words, um, make uh, worldview, customs, language, healing practices, educational practices, uh, illegitimate in the eyes of the um, world. And I basically saying, you know, your spirituality isn't as good as ours, your healing practices, your, not, your ways of knowing, your um, social practices, all of those are inferior. And um, I call um, all of that the big colonial lie. Um, and finally, 
um, in order to really uh, bring this uh, to uh, its final point, you have to you have to take the children, and because taking children so devastates the fabric of a society that is hard to recover. And that's what's happened to our um, indigenous people in the Americas and other places around the globe where colonial powers have uh, you taken uh, land and natural resources and um, for, for, for economic control. Um, sometimes I'm asked in a present presentation like this by non-native people. Um, well, that was a long time ago. Why don't you get over it? And my, um, my response always is, I'll get over it when you stop it. Um, because it's an ongoing process. It's still going on. Every one of those uh, items is a concern. Um, I think there were like nine Supreme Court cases last year that involved um, um, Native American issues, and they were all about one of those five things. And uh, so we always have to be on guard um, to um, not be losing um, in this continuing uh, colonial struggle. Well, if you um, if you think about um, this as a big colonial lie, then you realize um, that uh, colonialism really did a number on us. But what we see is a continuation, an intergenerational process in which those things not only continue on, a, on the basis of the struggle that I was talking about, but they continue to get the pain of the losses get handed down generation to generation. Now, some of that um, getting that intergenerational uh, and is historical trauma that comes down. I, um, I remember as a, a kindergartner, my mother walking me into school and I could tell by the tension in her hand and the shortness of her breath that school was not a safe place to go to. Now, so there's certain element of intergenerational trauma that's learned, that's, that's social learning. But much more than that, the mechanism of transmission is our adverse childhood experiences. And there's um, probably most of your audience has heard of adverse childhood experiences. There's a um, big study by Kaiser Permanente and the, and the Centers for Disease Control looking at um, 10, um, and initially nine, now I think there's 11 factors that are identified that if you experience these things as a child, uh, you, your health outcomes and your social outcomes are much poorer. And there are things like abuse and neglect and poverty and having a parent with a substance use disorder or mental health problem or witnessing violence is the, the, the list. Um, the, is, uh, the more that you have, the poorer your outcomes. Well, um, if you take a population and um, it experiences the type of um, adversity that comes with uh, colonialism and the loss of life, and in the case of uh, my people in the early um, 1800s, uh, perhaps as many as 70% of the people perished. Um, uh, that kind of pain gets handed down. So, in order for us to um, begin to understand um, the uh, impact of loss and grief that's perpetuated by um, adverse childhood experiences, and we know the boarding school history where children were removed, adding those traumas. We know about the removals of the, the, the 1960s and 70s that where children were um, continue, continuing to be removed through a child welfare system that was placing kids um, at an astronomical rate, uh, one in every four Indian children in out of home care before ICWA was passed. Um, it's no wonder that we can see the devastation um, and the discontinued cycle because once you experience that kind of removal, you're, uh, you find you're damaging 
um, parenting practices, damaging um, attachment capability, all of those things. Well, my message is um, that uh, colonialism does not define who we are. Historic trauma does not define who we are. Um, we are good and healthy people who terrible things happen to. And those things um, are persistent um, unless we heal them. Um, and we are the best judges of how to make that healing happen. We're nothing wrong with us as people, um, but we carry a tremendous load of historical trauma that contributes to adverse childhood experiences that perpetuate that trauma from generation to generation. And as long as any of our families have that experience, we are all in jeopardy. It's a collective, this is a collective experience. And so we have to think about every single family uh, being of value and being um, of value to the future well being of the existence of the indigenous peoples of this continent. And when we think about that in our own tribes, um, the future existence of who we are as tribal people is dependent on interrupting this cycle that started with um, this horrific experience of colonialism, but then becomes perpetuated by continuation of adverse experiences. So what I'm, I'm saying that child welfare has a part in that, that historically we have too often practiced a form of child welfare that didn't heal families that perpetuated the trauma. Um, when you give a list of things uh, that need to be done in order for people to either not lose their children or, um, or to get their children back when they've been taken away, and that list um, is a list of things that are far too large for any individual or any family to really be able to do, you're setting them up for failure and disaster because so many of the problems that our families face, you know, uh, most children come into the foster care system um, because of untreated mental health problems, uh, substance uh, use disorders, uh, poverty, um, the lack of uh, the um, healthy attachments and parenting practices, all um, all of these are problems that are too large for any one person to be able to solve. In fact, they're too large for any one agency, any one organization to solve. And so we have to rethink how we, how we do all of this. Well, back in 2005, um, the, we had an international gathering um, with um, the First Nations uh, Child and Family Caring Society in Canada and NICWA and the US uh, Child Welfare League and the Child Welfare League of Canada to try to describe what a new child welfare system would look like if we were really going to begin to heal these problems and, uh, and came up with something called the Touchstones of Hope. Um, Self-determination, you know, we as, as Indigenous people are in the best position to know what's important and good for us. Um, the importance um, of dealing with the structural issues, in other words, poverty and racism and, uh, and the um, untreated mental health programs or problems, all of these have to be dealt with uh, systematically. We have to begin to own what's wrong. We have to own what hurts in each and every one of our own communities to know that these things are, are things that are, that are hurting all of us, not just the families who are having problems, they're hurting all of us. And so as we own the things that hurt, we, we can then move them forward with compassion. 
We need to be able to have uh, programs and services that are non-discriminatory, that don't perpetuate racist stereotypes. Or, um, and we have to be able to make sure that families get treated with the, the kind of compassion and the kind of um, responsibility that our ancestors would ask of us. So um, all of these are just important pieces. Um, and our, in all of this, our culture matters because our culture teaches us how to heal. Our cultures teach us how to treat one another as human beings. And so starting there and um, knowing um, how we bring healing uh, to our families and how we keep ourselves healthy in the process um, helps us get down the road towards that decolonization process. It's, it's going to be long term. It took us a long time to get into this mess that we're in. It'll take us a while to get out, uh, but we can collectively do it if we learn how to um, decolonize, uh, begin to be able to blend services. And I, uh, I so uh, I heard Amy in her introduction talk about being a wraparound coordinator, doing wraparound services. I so much appreciate that uh, being part of what's happening in our tribal child welfare services because it's uh, it is um, we we have to be able to deal holistically with those problems that are far too large for any single individual so i think i'll stop there and turn it over to you guys for some questions and thoughts thank you terry uh, that was great uh, way to start i really appreciate what you had to say one of the things when you started was uh, you mentioned uh, decolonizing uh, and uh, a follow up to what you just said is, uh, you know, one thing you've said is there's no such thing as a cultural free child welfare. Yeah. Right. And uh, all of the notions that underpin social work practice have to do with cultural uh, issues. Right. And so I'm just wondering what are the ways if we can just unpack a little bit more of how we decolonize child welfare, whether it's through the relational worldview or just your experiences. If we can unpack, what does it mean that there's no such thing as a cultural free child welfare system? Yeah, well, um, what people see as desirable is the things that are important to their culture. Um, so, um, the mainstream culture values independence. Um, and, you know, uh, I've always um, seen that, that if you look back at the history of child welfare in the United States, it's not very old actually. Um, it started out um, in New York City uh, being in child protection operated by the ASPCA. And, American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, because there were no child abuse laws. And it's really based in the notion of controlling parents and rescuing children. And it's those who are deserving of help um, have the independence to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, you know, join the the, uh, the world of the progressive uh, American um, enterprise. Um, that's, I'm, that's all well and good if that's what you think, uh, you know, that's what you value in society. But it leaves a lot of people behind. Um, it leaves a lot of people in shame and in distress and uh, with disorders and problems that are, uh, that are that perpetuate then generation to generation. And it's a system that's focused on simply on rescuing the child. Um, and um, so social workers often become regulators rather than helpers. Um, saying um, the, um, you know, in order, you have to meet this list of conditions um, and you get help if you are willing and you are a good, you know, client. Um, 
the uh, and another um, uh, cultural uh, frame in the mainstream is that you don't intervene um, in people's lives um, until things get really bad. In other words, there's got to be a call to an 800 number um, or the report of child abuse and neglect before somebody's knocking on the door saying, I'm from child protection, I'm here to help you. Um, uh, one of our colleagues, uh, Andrew Beaver from um, the village of Queek in Alaska um, put together a child protection team and they knock on people's doors and say, is everybody all right? They don't wait for bruises. They don't wait for abandonment. They, they watch, they hear anytime there's a, a family that's struggling or maybe there's a domestic dispute or they heard there's a party, a um, group of elders are knocking on the door saying, is everybody all right? Um, and we want you to know we've got standards in our community about how children are treated. And, and um, you know, it's not okay for them to see, you know, you having a big party or um, having a, you know, a big fight. This is, um, now this village, has, uh, last I heard, hadn't had a placement outside their village in almost 10 years because they're, um, they're simply changing the frame of reference from child protection to child safety. Um, and so child welfare means something very different in their community. It means you pay attention, you have watchful eyes all over the community, you look for people who are in stress and you help them before there's any bruises, before there's any abandonment. You're giving people treatment for the th problems that are uh, that are they're struggling with, and um, so it's a it's a very different concept for how to operate child welfare. Is oh. one follow up to that? Uh, is that kind of what you mean by switching the the story or trying to change what the our native communities think of social work in the sense of that they need to think that it is medicine? Yeah. That that. Yeah, I, my, my, you know, if 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 what we do as social workers is uh, is not therapeutic, then we shouldn't be doing it. Um, one of my first, my second supervisor in social work was um, a licensed therapist, and I was working in a child uh, child welfare agency, and um, so he came on as a new supervisor and. One of our first meetings, he asked this in a staff meeting, what do you guys need? And everybody said, well, we need therapists um, to serve the families that we're working with. And, and he said, what do you guys do? And said, well, we're caseworkers, we're case managers. And he said, are you therapeutic? And we all looked at him like, what? And he said, well, if you're not therapeutic, I don't want you working here. And I thought, what a profound, what an important statement that was. He said, every family that we have to work with needs compassion, needs help, needs limits, um, but somebody that's going to be therapeutic. If you're out there just telling them what the rules are and tell them what they got to do, then uh, I'd like you to move on. That's because this is not, this is not the job for you. Now. Um, that's an important shift to make. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, most of public child welfare in the United States is terribly underfunded. Um, if you look at why it's underfunded, um, it's because the culture does not value the families who are in the system. They're not the deserving poor. I mean, they, they will spend a lot more money on foster care than they will spend on helping families because it's um, the cultural framework is that the uh, families who aren't deserving, um, who, who have uh, moral shortcomings of being, you know, whatever the stereotypical label is, um, 
ne'er do wells or you know lazy or or um, you know the, the that's not where you put your money well um, uh, that's why I said earlier we have a different con conceptualization of that if you think every family is important um, to the continued existence of us all then you knock on the door and you say is everybody all right you know um, you're we see you struggling and and um, uh, you're important to you're important to my healing you know my I'm not whole unless you're whole um, let's uh, let's figure out how to get you there and and that's as I say that's that's a long process Thank you, Terry. That was very powerful. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Chris uh, Shaw. I know he's done some work in preparing some questions for you, Terry. So, uh, Chris, could you uh, did you have a question or uh, something you wanted to, to contribute to the conversation? Uh, yeah, uh, my question was basically uh, about the stigma of uh, child welfare and social work in general. How in many Native and minority communities. They have this view of uh, social workers or child welfare workers that like they're to be afraid of or they're to be someone you shouldn't trust. So my question is, how can we uh, kind of get that stigma away and get it to the point where people will look at us as someone who is there to heal them rather than the traditional thing of they're here to do something horrible to me? Yeah, that's a it's a huge problem, and it's well it's a well deserved. Um, uh, label uh, amongst some, um, unfortunately, and I think it you know it gets back to the um, problem that people that the the system is not well designed, nor is the system um, uh, well staffed in terms of having uh, the right kinds of training. Um, and you know it's it's hard um, to have services that are comprehensive when you've got the size of caseload that most public child welfare workers have. Um, it's a tough job. I tell people um, they're the two toughest jobs in the whole United States. Uh, the worker that knocks on the door and says, I'm here from child protection. I'm here you know, because I've got a, a report of child abuse and neglect. I can come in and talk with me. And the other toughest job is being an elected tribal official. <laughs> there, there aren't any two jobs that are harder than those two. And, and so I, um, what I would like you know, for, um, uh, for every child welfare worker, and, I, and I, I'm hopeful that we can do this at the tribal level. I'm less hopeful that we can do it at the state level, though some places do it much better than others. Um, is um, to begin to overcome that stereotype and that stigma of being a child welfare worker. Um, and what overcomes that is how we, how we engage people. And, um, the, um, and at this point, it is, um, has everything to do with relationship and being acting therapeutically. Um, and, and that, um, that doesn't mean that we don't hold people accountable or responsible for their actions. As a matter of fact, one of the most therapeutic things we can do is to own with people what, what hurts um, and to be able to describe a future that's better um, than they have. Um, when I was practicing, I learned um, for example, in, in the conversation about permanency, about if you're gonna be able to raise your child, um, to sit with somebody and say, you will ultimately make the decision about whether you raise your child. The court will enforce what, your, what the decision is that you make. Um, your behavior is what's the most essential in this. Um, and I will help you get there. And we can describe what it is and what you need to be doing and what you need to have 
um, in order to reach the goal that you want. And, um, but I, I, you know, I, I can't do it for you and I need you to know the consequences of your actions. That's, um, so the, the, the very clear honesty um, and, um, and I, another thing that I uh, in, would tell families and I encourage workers all the time um, is, um, is to say, um, you can absolutely count on me for one thing. Um, I will keep, I will help keep your child safe. And, uh, and I want you to be my partner in keeping the child safe. Because that's our first job foremost. foremost. Um, we're in this together. And if, if keeping your child safe means I have to keep them away from you, um, you should be thanking me for that. Because uh, somewhere down deep inside, you know that your behavior is not safe for your child. I know, I'd like to help you change that. I'd like to help you have that be different. So do you want to come along? You know, we, let's, let's go do that. Uh, we can start today. Let's, let's talk about what it means to visit. Let's talk about, so to get task oriented, to be absolutely brutally honest and say, and let's do it different right now. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, that, that made sense. It makes sense, Chris. He's on mute. He's on uh, mute. Yeah, that was very helpful. Sorry, my okay. stupid thing wasn't working. Yeah, that was very yeah. helpful. Uh, and that leads me to my follow-up question. Um, what can you, what advice can you give people who are like, like me, who are going into that MSW program or are going into child welfare? Uh, how could you give them any advice of like getting rid of those stigmas or just having that, uh, the foresight of what to go into, what they're going into. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you. We need good people. And so I commend you for your decision. That's, um, that's great. Uh, you. And, um, you know, um, in, uh, it, remember to be therapeutic. Um, and if you want some direction, some thinking about how to be therapeutic, look to your ancestors first. Um, you know, um, I, I learned what I, I learned, I'm, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I learned the technique of therapy from consulting psychiatrists who watched me through one-way glass and taught me how to do, you know, play therapy and other things. I learned the art of healing from, uh, a traditional healer in my own community who was a mentor to me. And when you are, um, when you engage in relationship, um, you're um, crossing a spiritual boundary um, that, you know, we talk about boundaries and social work. Well, um, when you are, uh, when you really form the type of relationship that's required to be therapeutic, you're you're uh, way into um, using yourself in a way that's both potentially positive and potentially dangerous, and. Um, so respecting the relationship and treating people with a lot of dignity and taking the responsibility to keep that relationship safe um, and, and crystal clear um, is essential. So, and I, um, for the most part, there are exceptions to this, our, our traditional healers and helpers knew how to do that. They knew how to do it because they dealt in the realm of spirituality and understood the spiritual nature of relationships and how vulnerable our spirit is when we get into those kinds of helping relationships. So 
take care of the integrity of your own spirit and you'll take care of things like confidentiality because um, you know um, the reason we don't talk about what happens in our ceremonies is because it would lose its power if we did the reason you hold confidentiality is that your relationships will lose their power if you blab so thank you those are great questions mm -hmm. are great answers to my questions yeah so uh now i'm going to turn it over to amy uh i know amy has done a lot of preparation too uh for uh asking you a question terry so amy uh this could be you know any follow-up or uh any sort of other direction uh you may want uh, Terry to go into uh, with the remainder of our talk. Terry, um, I just felt what you were talking about so powerful um, for somebody who just recently came out of what you described as one of the hardest jobs ever. <laughs> yeah. I really um, appreciated it. I feel like the hardest part of that job is the knowledge that when you are going to knock on somebody's door and they open it and you say that you're from child welfare, that um, that creates trauma um, in their life and in their family, um, just by the nature of what child welfare has meant uh, to these communities. Um, and so just thinking about having, being able to knock on the door and having somebody be like, oh my gosh, thank goodness you're here. You're here to help me. Yeah. Just like, it's overwhelming to think about what a difference that would make for our families. And, you know, for me, having been a child welfare worker and my and sustainability and all of that in our community. So thank you for speaking to that because I feel like it doesn't have, we don't have to be a traumatic presence. Um, we can be a healing presence. So reimagining what that looked like is, is really powerful. Um, so thank you. And um, one, I think another struggle with that I saw while I was in child welfare is that often when um, families come into the system, we're funneling them into um, programs and interventions that aren't meeting their needs, whether that's because uh, they're punitive, uh, they're not culturally based, um, or you know, a whole host of other reasons, and they're not really transformative, they're more just a, a box to check off. And to me, I feel like it's a well, a well known issue. And um, I was reading about, you know, your understanding of relational worldview within um, indigenous based programs, and how um, within that worldview, uh, you treat the balance um, within an individual and within a community, rather than treating um, the individual and that particular problem that may be seen as wrong. So I was wondering if you could speak to what it means to treat the balance and how you've seen that work practically within um, child welfare. Oh, yes. <laughs> did we lose him? I will. Uh, I'm not Terry. Uh, we just Hi. lost Terry, uh, but he should be getting on uh, right back. I, some Maybe some uh, reception. Uh, so uh, stay stay tuned. That was a great question. Uh, I think uh, I'll see if he's uh, sending an email. Sometimes there's these hiccups. Uh, I know that he said that he was uh, having difficulties with uh, the uh, reception uh, at his home. So I'm waiting to see if I get an email. But uh, I think it's a, a good question, Amy. I think that, you know, I think the Terry's relational worldview uh, is very much in line with a lot of what we're trying to do at Two Feathers, which is taking the context into consideration. You know, I think that he has uh, really been at the forefront of, of making culture and relationships and context matter in, in social uh, work and, and mental health. And so I'm taking a stab at answering your question but uh, you know, I think it's really uh, th that context matters, and doing, and you know, raising the awareness of of issues uh, that are uh, that let's say are are not uh, that shouldn't be uh, worked through in a traditional sort of mainstream sense. Uh, so that's my shot at your answer. But uh, 
Chris, uh, did you have a, a question uh, for Virgil as I stand in for Terry? Uh, yeah, I have to visualize that as Virgil first and not Terry. So let me take a minute for that. Um, I was a uh, I was really impressed by uh, just the advocacy of Terry. So I'm gonna add that, put that on to you. If you could talk a little bit about the advocacy and how important it is to be an advocate and how to like get that seat at the table, so to speak, and for you, not only like yourself, but for the people that you're working for. Like, cause I know Two Fellas is big on that and I know Terry is big on that. So maybe I'll ask you and then when Terry comes back, we can ask him that question. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's relevant, you know, uh, to today, you know, we actually had one of our youth at Two Feathers today, uh, Kiera, she just testified uh, at the assembly, the, Cal the governor's uh, office in, in Sacramento to get this bill passed uh, for uh, suicide, the office of suicide prevention. And uh, I got a text message that it passed. And so I think, you know, that's one example of, of advocacy and, and really trying to uh, get the, the native perspective uh, involved or in part of the story because oftentimes it's, it's left out of the story. And so I think for me, advocacy is getting our native story uh, told and building those relationships so that we can do something like we just did today, which is Kira and our great mentor, Wakara Scott, advocated on native rights in the state of California uh, today. It was, you know, just at 1.30. And uh, Kiera testified for three minutes about her own life and the importance of having beha a behavioral health uh, team, family around her for her own, uh, you know, uh, thriving. And so, uh, but we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't built relationships with uh, people within the state and the county and they reached out to us. And so to answer your question, and my guess in part of what Terry will say is building relationships and, and then you know getting outside of our comfort zone and, and telling our story. And our story is different than uh, many uh, of uh, non-Indigenous stories in, in the terms of uh, a different perspective, different needs, uh, and really uh, how structural and historical and political issues have impacted our community. So that's kind of a long-winded answer to your question, Chris. Uh, you know, we're still waiting. Uh, for those of you that are still tuned in, we're still waiting for Mr. Cross to get back on uh, because he's having some... Uh, we have Mr. Cross back on. Uh, so for those of you that have still tuned in with us, let us know through the comment section how Chris myself and Amy did uh, in the, can you hear us, Terry? I can, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. That was, uh, you know, we're at Two Feathers. We're really been trying to, to practice improv. And so we did a little <laughs> bit of improv uh, and talking on our uh, feet, but we're yeah. also updating the audience, the people that are tuning in that the bill that uh, one of our youth uh, testified at 1 30 on got passed oh cool so it's pretty cool and and yeah. that kind of segues right into uh a question that chris had and then maybe we could return to amy's uh question but was around advocacy in that you know i know that that people like your uh, executive director your current one is is said that you're one of the the greatest advocates of for Indian children in the last 40, 50 years. And so Chris, his question was like, what does it take to be a good advocate? What does it mean to advocate for, for children's rights and children's welfare? Oh, uh, how long do you have? <laughs> it's a- uh, Got about uh, 15, 20 minutes. <laughs> it, you know, um, I tell people um, the secret uh, is showing up. And um, and showing up is looks different all of the time, but it, sometimes it means you put in awfully long hours. Um, you you strategic about finding the places that you can um, raise your voice um, to um, to say what needs to be said. Um, uh, it, it is so important to talk to people. Um, 
and talk to young people talk and I learned long ago that if I went to uh, walk the halls of Congress and talk to congressmen they they would there's I would get to meet with their staff um, and the staff would nod politely and take my paper and off I'd go um, if I took um, a, a tribal leader with me to those meetings um, I would get listened to in a whole different way but if I took a youth with me, um, we'd get legislation passed. <laughs> so um, really um, learning how to be strategic, how to build alliances. Um, NICWA uh, has relationships with over a uh, two dozen national child uh, advocacy organizations because um, we need every, when we go in uh, on a, policy issue involving Native children. Um, we want every children's advocacy organization in the country to be behind us. We want every tribe. We never go to Congress with an idea um, without having vetted it with elected tribal officials first. Getting resolutions from regional tribal organizations from the, and from the National Congress of American Indians. So that when we're talking to, to congressional leaders or anyone else, they say, well, what what are the what's the tribe's positions? We can pull out a resolution, um, and I, you know, Nikwa um, in since 1990, Nick was responsible for bringing more than three billion dollars of services to Indian children and families, and almost none of it is earmarked Indian money. Um, it has been chipping away at uh, things like the child care and development block grants and um, 4E and um, 4B and TANF and uh, getting tribal provisions put into those laws so that our tribes could get access to that funding. And so, um, but it, it, it took 17 years to get tribes access to 4E, for example. So when I say show up, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's for the long term. Thank you. And, and is that some of the, when you uh, described uh, being an advocate, is that also some of the same skills that it takes to, to build a national organization like uh, NICWA, or is there different sort of skills uh, that it takes? Well, having started a nonprofit uh, and growing it, you know, from a one person shop to, uh, you know, staff of 25, you get to do every job that ever was. So it helps if you are um, ha ha have uh, ADHD. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you have, uh, um, you know, if you have the desire to learn lots of things, you have lots of um, interests and um, uh, you get to do so many different things. Um, and, you know, I, um, uh, the job never stayed the same more than a year or two at a time, always shifting, always changing, always a challenge. Um, it, and you never do it alone. You know, and I had a, I, I have the title founder, but it was about 20 people who really made it happen. Um, I'm the scribe, you know, um, the, um, Ron Allen, who used to be the president of NCAI, described one time um, in a meeting I was in um, what a scribe leader is. It's a young Indian person who gets put up the front to write things down on the flip chart. And then pretty soon the, you get done writing everything in the flip chart and one of the elders says, okay, now you're gonna present it. Um, and um, that's how I got to be a leader. Um, you know, um, I was scared to death to speak in public but because uh, elders said, no, you're gonna get up there and do this for us. You get up there and do it. And, and um, you know, after a while you get used to it. And so I, like Ron Allen, I described myself as a, as a scribe leader. You know, the, I, I learned by writing things down that the elders said and then reporting out for them. And so um, you get a, you know, it's a pretty highfalutin title to be called founder. You have to remember that you've got many, many people behind you than uh, just putting your name on paper and, uh, you know, isn't the, 
uh, it isn't all of it. <laughs> so, uh, you now, being a, an executive director, one of the secrets is uh, always being ready to move on because you serve at the whim of the people who are really um, behind the program. So. Thank you. Uh, one thing, you know, in doing some follow up or some research on you, Terry, I, I thought, you know, one of the things that I took uh, from my own research on you is the your ability to build relationships and get buy in from so many different tribal organizations and people to really, it seems, build a movement around child welfare rights. And, and in my brief time in, in working in native communities as a professional, I, I, could, I see how challenging it can be politically and just with relationships and getting people on the same page uh, and thinking about not just yourself or your own community, but the, the larger native community. And so I was impressed with you know, that it seems like the skill that you have to do that. It, uh, you know, I, I, I know um, there's some skills involved in, you know, community organizing skills. Some, um, my, con my concentration in graduate school was group work and community organizing. And um, so I learned a lot of good stuff there. Um, but I also um, learned very early on every Indian community, native community in the country has people who wanna make the lives of our children and families better. And I have always said, it's my job to find them and to you know, give them the support and help that they need um, to, to do that. And, uh, to the what, whether it's encouragement or helping make sure there's money for them to get to do the work or um, and and just to be and to say um, so tell me how you did this so I can tell 10 other people how to do how to do this um, and that's what networking is about you know it's about um, making sure that um, the Pe that people can do what's in their heart to do. One of the most frequent questions I was asked in the first 20 to 30 years of this work, when I would go into communities um, and organize and around these issues, people would say, can we do that? Um, and it was because people had been so conditioned that they didn't have permission to solve their own problems, you know, and um, and I, you know, I I, I come, um, I say my mom's my mom has just passed away last year, um, ninety three. Her generation was a generation of fear, um, and I grew up during what I call the generation of anger. Um, you know, it was the American Indian Movement. It was the you know, um, you know, war and poverty, it was, you know, a lot of organizing um, in, and um, uh, now I see young people coming through NICWA who are not encumbered by either the fear or the anger, um, and they're really getting the job done. And sometimes us uh, who were that generation of anger, you know, Sometimes you get so cussed you forget to put your hammer down, and um, you know um, it's a, so you have to be careful not to um, use your tongue sharpener too much. Uh, it's you know it hurts people when you do, and um, and you don't get your job done if you don't learn to build those out you know alliances and um, you still have to tell the truth, but you have to. You have to re you have to realize that in uh, we're only two percent one percent of the population and we need all the allies we can get so um, and even if you're a bozo I'll try to convince you to come over and join us because we want you to reform and and to give up that colonial mindset and because um, we want to take care of our kids that's all 
what's is that a um you know i would say you know is there something wrong with that picture that we want to have responsibility to solve our own problems take care of our own kids build our own economies now now tell me what's the problem with that and if you can convince me that that's not the right thing to do then i'll you know i'll quit this stuff but nobody's ever convinced me of that yet <laughs> so i keep at it you know, the other thing of an advocate is i always talk you know give me a place to talk <laughs> and i'll go for it so nice so right before uh we lost you for a little bit amy speaking of giving a place to talk amy had a question <laughs> and so i i didn't want to leave her hanging uh before we end and i see we have a little bit of time left uh so Amy, did you want to follow up on that question you had for uh, Terry? Sure, thank you, Virgil. Um, my question was just about uh, relational worldview, Terry, and how you see um, see it looking in child welfare as far as uh, how do we treat the balance? Yeah, um, yeah. The, um, the relational worldview is uh, really about seeing problems in their solution as a matter of balance across mind, body, spirit, and context. And again, I look to our traditional helpers and healers, and almost always, if you look at how they practice, they're working every single quadrant um, and every all of the time. And you can see that in something like, uh, like sweat lodge ceremony. Um, you never do it alone. There's a set of teachings that go with it. Um, there's, um, you sweat, you know, so it changes your body or maybe fasting or feasting afterwards, or maybe aromatic herbs or, you know, whatever in the, um, as part of the ceremony and there's sacred songs and there's prayer and ritual and ceremony. And so you're working all four quadrants and you know, it works and you feel better, but you're hard pressed to draw a linear cause and effect line between those two things. I, and so, um, Another way that I think about it is what an Im incredible, critical thinking tool it is. Um, I get to do consultation because I'm um, a licensed clinical social worker. I, I do some clinical consultation. So sitting down with an um, advocate or a worker with a young person and just say, you know, saying, well, let, let's look at what's going on for you in the four quadrants of the relational worldview. And, you know, what's, um, tell me what's happening. And, and uh, let's look at a strategy for you to start feeling better. Um, and, um, and young people can, you know, they can take a look at those four quadrants, they start uh, tracking. Um, I asked this young one, one young man who was, um, He's truant from school. Um, his parents were upset with him, you know. And so we started tracking that around. Well, it turns out it, his stomach hurt. I said, "What's you know what's happening physically for you? Your my stomach hurts. Well, why is my stomach hurting? Because kids at school say mean things. Well, you know what are the things that they're saying? Well, he was a subject. You know, he's, he's experiencing racism." Um, in school and he wasn't able to tell anybody because he didn't quite even conceptualize it himself. So that being a victim of bullying, it's racially motivated was, um, you know, here he was in trouble with his parents because he was missing school when he was just plain hurting inside. And it, you know, he just needed a mechanism by which he could um, decipher that himself and then begin to create solutions. Um, so for him, coming back into balance was to look at how how one dynamic was bouncing around all four qu quadrants of the circle. So it can be really big or just really small. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I see uh, you take uh, one one more question, Terry. Sure. Uh, and we and we might add. There's some questions from the audience, but yeah. the, the just as a way of sort of summarizing or, or bringing uh, our conversation into today's uh, times, yeah. you know, I know that you've been at this work for a long time, and there's a lot, and there's a lot of uh, changes that have occurred uh, over the last forty years, 
and we've made a lot of progress. And so the question uh, for you, Terry, is, is what is some of the, the two or three sort of biggest uh, ways that we've made progress in terms of uh, taking care of our children? And what are uh, some of the most pressing issues currently, whether it's ICWA, whether it's uh, you know, the, the, the person in the, the White House, uh, or whether whatever you, you think, what are some of the most pressing issues currently uh, that we face that, that we should uh, prioritize? And so uh, just a little bit of summary, uh, what are some of the th ways that we've for, you know, made significant progress and what are some of the ways that we work that we need to continue to do? Yeah, well, I always tell people if things get as much better in the next 45 years as they've been gotten in the last, we'll be in awfully good shape. Um, because things have so dramatically changed. When I started in this work, um, this uh, prior to ICWA, um, I couldn't get uh, a young person that I was working with who's a victim of a um, you know, sexual um, assault, I couldn't get her any help at all. Um, and there was no, there was no tribal court, um, the uh, outside law enforcement wouldn't come onto the reservation. You couldn't get a call back from the FBI. Um, so nobody was being prosecuted for hurting our kids. Um, and there was, uh, there was no child welfare department. Um, so man, things have just dramatically changed. There, and so when I got my MSW, there were less than 100 American Indian people in the country who had a master's degree in social work, and less than a dozen of us that had experience in child welfare. And so when ICWA passed, that's, you know, I got drawn in right away because I just, you know, had this background in, in working in the area, and my expertise was not in policy, but in working with families. And, um, you know, I... Um, you know, you mentioned in my introduction, I had uh, authored uh, Positive Indian Parenting. Well, I had been trained as a parent trainer at University, or, um, Penn State University uh, in uh, PET, Parent Effectiveness Training. And there was such a gap in Indian country when we first started about parent education. I thought, I, you know, we would adapt you know, uh, parent effectiveness training to Indian country. The farther I got into it, the more I understood that we really couldn't adapt it. But after two years of conversations with elders and traveling in Canada and other places, um, we put together Positive Indian Parenting, which is now 30 some years old and it's still going strong, still being used, um, which is very incredible. Um, so the big change is self-determination of child welfare. See, ICWA did two very important things. It, it uh, recognized tribes' rights to run their own child welfare program, to have our own courts and codes and laws and programs. And then it set up the rules that states have to follow when they take Indian children into custody. Both of those are equally important, but the tremendous change in how uh, for uh, our families, I believe, has been driven by the tribes, again, owning what hurts and uh, solving those problems and making the lives of children and families better um, and through their own child welfare services. And, and the same is true in health and in education and in child care. And, um, and a big part of that is uh, the attention to rights and resources and the voices of different organizations, because Nick was not the only organization that grew. There's many others, uh, you know, the National Indian Education Association and National Indian Health Board, and um, you know, gosh, it's there's a long list, and um, it's been a pleasure to work over the years with the directors of those organizations and and support one another because I think we we really gained an understanding that. Um, we, we, none of us could do this alone. And de part of decolonization was to break down the silos and to know that 
uh, every one of us is dependent on everybody else's success. So I got to help. I got to give the problem away. I got to help everybody solve the problems that they're facing. It's, uh, I can only do so much, but um, I, I can't do what I do at the expense of anybody else because um, the, you know, our child welfare is dependent on economic development. Um, economic development is dependent on the, the uh, quality of the court systems that we have. The, um, it's all one thing. So, you know, Amy asked about that relational worldview. Um, it, we have to be unified in the whole of that. Um, and to, because the, the interdependent nature of our well being is uh, based in the balance across that circle uh, for our whole culture, as well as each of us as individuals. Thank you. And as the final follow up, what should we be mindful of in, in the current times and be whether it's advocates for lead, leading in what are the pressing issues as you see it, Terry, in these uh, times? They're all pressing. <laughs> They're pressing pretty hard at the moment. Um, and for all of us to remember. Um, to be, um, uh, to remember that it, it will pass and, and that how we handle this today will have an awful lot to do with what the future looks like for our children and families. Um, in that, um, I, I, I think that we have a really important choice to make. Um, so whether um, we're going to um, hold to what my tribe uh, in the Haudenosaunee peoples describe as the good mind um, and to, to add to the balance or whether we participate in the chaos. Um, we're in a moment of chaotic thinking that's very negative and very divided. Um, holding um, ourselves to the highest standard, um, giving to one another's um, well-being um, is essential. This, this, this will pass. Um, in, uh, and how we come out the other end um, is the choice um, that we have as, as people. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to get caught up in the chaos of the moment. And um, um, I certainly um, go there more often than I, than I think is healthy for me to go there. Um, uh, if, if we think about all of the things, um, you have to remember, and I, you know, I, I go back to the teachings of my elders. One, my mentor said, it's important for us as Haudenosaunee people, and maybe, you know, I think this is true for other tribal people as well. It's important for us to pray the world into balance every day. And so I, I've been hiding out from COVID-19 and out in the Oregon coast and next to the beach. So I go walk on the beach every day. And uh, I like to pick up stones because the, the, um, there's such an amazing variety as well as um, millions of years of history. And, uh, you know, it reminds you that, you know, some of the stones you pick up are petrified wood or they're petrified shells or fossils. And, you know, they're like millions of years old. And, and some are just stones. 
and you don't know that you don't <laughs> you don't know what to have. And so I'm taken to um, uh, blessing and try to bless every stone I pick up is, that I put down because there's just so much, you know, to um, to hold in reverence, but also um, in in our Haudenosaunee ways, as I understand them, and I always kind of risk getting into trouble saying, so I un this, when I speak, I say what I understand, what I've been taught to, about this, is that um, creation didn't happen in seven days for us. It's an ongoing process. It's unfolding at every moment of every day. And we get to participate in it. We participate in it in our with our words and our actions towards other people. We participate in it by how we think about how we, you know, how we hold our thoughts, how we hold our mind, how we treat the world around us, how we treat other people. And my um, the the spirits that helped our ancestors survive are still there and they're waiting for us to call on them because our ancestors called on them in terrible times of stress and need and they survived and we're here because it we're we're we are the manifestation of the prayers of our ancestors by all rights we shouldn't be here because of the genocide but we are and so um when i pick up that stone and I bless that stone and I think of un being an agent in the unfolding of creation with all other things. And I, I think it's praying the universe back into balance. So maybe just a little task for every day. Huh? Thank you, Terry. It's a very powerful and I think fitting uh, end to our conversation today. Uh, I want to thank Chris and Amy and you, Terry, for having a, a wonderful dialogue and conversation. I also want to thank everybody that uh, tuned in today. And, and we uh, see your comments, see your questions. We are trying to answer all the questions. Uh, and if there's any uh, pressing ones, I could send it maybe over to Terry via email. Uh, but uh, other than that, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we will be back at it on uh, Wednesday and Friday this week. Uh, look out for the flyers and uh, have a good rest of the week and a good rest of your Monday. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.